the idea for the Entertainment Technology Center actually came from a former dean of the college, the school, the co school of computer science named Raj Reddy. And in fact, he was on an advisory board at the University of Southern California. This is in the mid 90s, and he came back here, uh, since we're in LA, and said to them, you know, the filmmaking industry is going to go from analog to digital. And so you need to focus on the whole digitization of your uh, in indigenous art form. But then he came back to Pittsburgh and realized, well, we had computer science, drama, we have that. And he, sort of as a skunk works, he asked me and another colleague named uh, Scott Stevens to, to look into it. And this coincided at the same time when a, an advisory board from drama came back and said, you know, you need to start working in the digital media. And we had a new president at the time named Jerry Cohen. So it was this real convergence. I mean, there was Raj's uh, impetus. There was me in the College of, of uh, School of Computer Science. Randy Pausch had just come back and was doing Building Virtual Worlds. And you had the Drama Advisory Board saying, hey, you need to do digital work. And you had a new president saying, what am I going to do? You know, what, what, how do I make my mark? And bingo, we started the Entertainment Technology Center. They brought Randy and I together. I mean, there, there is a great deal of stasis. In other words, this is the way it's been done, this is the way we do things, and as with any existing structure, it has its own power plants, you know, and that, uh, well, gee, I'm in charge of this committee, I'm in charge of that committee, and you end up with, with essentially a moribund structure, when the fact of the matter is the only constant is change. I mean, we're looking at technology change, you know, every year practically, and yet we have ex uh, existing structures in academe that haven't changed in a hundred years. I mean, the disconnect, you, you need people to say this is unacceptable nowadays. That's me. It is still the case in the Entertainment Technology Center that most of the students are aspiring gamers. All right, they want to wind up in, in the game industry, although one of the reasons we call it the Entertainment Technology Center rather than the Video Game Center is because I don't want to just teach video games. And in fact, personally, I think teaching video games to an aspiring video game person is almost self-defeating. It's like you want them to see and experience everything else because for the most part they know the games. That's, that's why we have uh, young people who are interested in location-based entertainment, theme parks. We have a number who are interested in edutainment. We have a large number who are interested in serious games, right? The use of games for everything from you know health to uh, simulation, things of that nature. We also have a fair number of students who are interested in the mechanical end, in other words, mechanical engineering, interactive animatronic robots. I mean, it's funny because Carnegie Mellon is the largest robotics school, but they're building robots to like go to the Mar go to Mars. We're building robots so a child can laugh. The whole dynamic of, of interdisciplinary is, is something that needs semantical distinction. I've had and heard of many places that say we're interdisciplinary, we want our students to go take a class in computer science. We want our students to take an art class. I don't consider that interdisciplinary. The, the distinction that we have in the ETC is that our, our faculty is ETC faculty. The ETC faculty are comprised of computer scientists, of artists, of 2D art specialists, uh, 3D artists, of dramatists, of, um, of literary people, of mechanical engineers, and we all live together. That's a very different dynamic. All right? Because the other way, it's really a smorgasbord. It's like saying, oh yes, I'm, I'm a globalist. I will eat at a Thai restaurant once a month. Sorry, that doesn't qualify you. And I think that it's very important that we are living and, sh and breaking bread together. That at a faculty meeting, the computer science faculty member is talking about this student and, and, and so is the art professor talking about this student and with, with tangible experience from what that student has been working on in a real world project for a real world client who is expecting some sort of working prototype slash deliverable as a result. That's the unique thing. And so when, when I see that, then I'm like, okay, you're serious about, about interdisciplinary. The dynamic behind teaching as a partnership is recognizing that the, the rate of change, the rate of transformation that is occurring in technology today, it is impossible for any teacher to keep up with it. 
You know, in the same way that we look at the power of distributed computing, we need to, to recognize the power of distributed knowledge. So if you have a class of 25, 30 students, odds are pretty good that you're going to have a cohort here that went out and bought the iPad and has put that sucker through its paces. Odds are pretty good that you'll have a group over here that has had some familiarity with the Microsoft multi-touch surface table. Odds are pretty good, just throw out the technology. And what you want to do is aggregate that knowledge. You know, in the same way that students will teach students. And, and in fact, some of the most powerful learning will occur with, when a student is stuck and says to a teammate, I, I just don't understand, understand you know, Perl scripting language. Can you help me on this? And it's the, it's the students that are going to help each other. The faculty member you know, just doesn't have the time and very often the expertise to be able to do that one-on-one. -on -one. And so really, it, you, know, you talk about cloud computing. I'm looking at cloud teaching, cloud education, and using young people who are early adapters and you know, financially, there are so few prohibitions nowadays to a young person going out and buying the newest technology that you really have got to rely on them as the knowledge base for new technologies and to impart that to the faculty as well as the students. Well, I'm a member of that cohort that isn't so young. And I do think that when you, you know, I'm 57 years old. And, you know, according to the world in five years, I should be hanging it up, you know, and just getting out of the way. And frankly, I try to get out of the way as it is now. But the whole idea of lifelong education which is actually an initiative that is taking off in this country. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, we have the Academy for Lifelong Learning. And, and frankly, I think we're recognizing that we've got it all backwards. The idea that school is for when you're young is, is not incorrect, but the idea that school ends is incorrect. And in fact, it's really post-retirement, post your professional career, shall we say, that you really have the opportunity to go forth and learn whatever. I mean, to start your third career, your third life. And I think that's very much up to you. I don't know how many of us, you know, my age are going to become, you know, techno geek experts. But so much of, of the value of technology is finding applications. What is it for? How can it be used in ways that have never been thought of? How does it have relevancy or, you know, veracity in this discipline and nobody thought about that? That's where the senior citizen, the one who is, who's been around, the one who has seen things, is able to make the connections. Now granted, there will be wisdom in the same way that you have you know, business volunteers for the arts. Oh, I've done this for 40 years, let me tell you. This is a different form of that because this is not necessarily bringing knowledge you've already had, you know, experience, but this is more, okay, how do you, at 60 years old, how do you see the world? And how can you see the world using this technology? That is a force we have not yet tapped. And that's a force that I'm, I'm very excited about as we, as we view this, this teamwork of education as spanning from you know, childhood all the way to you know, senior adulthood. You know, my, my standard line is, this is the University of Earth. And our job is to figure out a major before we graduate. And I think for so many of us who have you know, gone and been here for a number of decades, I'm still trying to find out what is my, I think I know what my major is. I'm trying to figure out my minors at this point. And I'm hoping to get a couple of minors before I graduate.